Thanks very much, Art. Um, it's a uh, true honor to uh, talk about uh, Mike. Um, I was a student of Mike. I spent 32 years of uh, association with him. Um, Art reviewed his scientific uh, uh, discoveries and contributions. Uh, but what is not being discussed is his mentorship. Uh, over the last uh, four decades, uh, he has had uh, over 100 plus uh, students and postdocs and visitors. Um, and, um, and so earlier this month, um, 65 of us got together in Cambridge uh, and a wonderful evening. And, um, and we had a chance to compare notes. Um, we could have talked about Mike and have uh, a lot of gossip. But what came out was that, um, you know, each one of us has left in the last four decades from Mike's lab and have gone to um, do science. Uh, but what Mike uh, mentored us, Mike taught us, Mike showed us how to do science, how to be part of the scientific community, but how to be humble. Um, and those were the qualities of his. Uh, but as I pick up a few of the comments made by some of the members of his labs, uh, uh, Frank Abendorf has said uh, he kept very high standard professional ethics and being the perfect scientific role model. Uh, Francois Harvey would say, you have been a genuine mentor for my uh, career. As Kurt would say, uh, made me a better scientist for that, I will always be a grateful. Uh, Sabine would say, the time in Cambridge has shaped my professional life. And as Brian Sprott would say, you made me a better oligonotite chemist. So my stories keep on going, and I'm not going to bore you with all of that. But that was the sentiment. So he has left uh, a great impression on all of his uh, students. Uh, not only his students, uh, but his collaborators as well. And uh, his current collaborators, Matt, would, couldn't be here. And so he sends his uh, note, which I'm gonna read, Mike. Mike, you have played enormously important uh, role in the last 15 years, uh, working with us on the development of new generation of peptide, oligonucleotide drugs. Uh, without your dedication, uh, insights, and generous collaborative spirit, uh, we wouldn't certainly be uh, where we are today. My enormous congratulations and very best wishes to you for a lifetime of uh, stellar achievements. And we hope that uh, there will be many more fruitful years ahead of our joint uh, collaborative adventures. So Mike, personally, I'm grateful to you for giving me a chance in your lab. It's been three decades. I still remember all those wonderful years. So with that, let me introduce you to give a Lifetime Achievement Award. The title is A Life's Work on Oligonotides from Chemical Synthesis to Peptide PMO for Treatment of Neuromuscular Diseases. Mike. Thank you very much, uh, Art and Sudhir. It's a great pleasure and honor to be uh, standing here in front of you receiving this award. Following on from uh, Fritz Eckstein, my great friend and colleague for many years, and well as Stan Crook, who uh, is a pioneer in anti-sense, of course. Um, so it, it's, it's very, uh, very humbling to, to go in, uh, along after the, these sort of um, remarkable people. Now, I've spent the majority of my time um, in, um, uh, in this building here on the left, which is the original M M Medical Research Council Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. 38 years in this rather old building. Um, in fact, the chemistry lab was up here on the first floor, right next to the fire escape, so in case there was any problems, we could nip out the fire escape and down the stairs really quickly. Fortunately, we didn't have too many problems. At, uh, um, uh, and then uh, in, in um, 2013, we moved into a lovely new building, um, uh, which is much more spa spacious and airy, um, and really uh, is, does justice to the remarkable people who have worked through this and, and now work in, in the laboratory of molecular biology. So I'm delighted to have been there for, for, for so many years, uh, 42 years altogether. Um, now, but I want to take you back 47 years now uh, to when I first started work uh, on oligonucleotides. And I'm going to take you on a, on a journey through the career, showing you how 
uh, I think we've gone from synth synthetic oligonucleotides and how to make them all the way through now towards the clinic, which I think is very, very exciting. Um, and the, my first mentor uh, was this guy, Albert Stanley Jones, in the University of Birmingham. Now, most of you, probably all of you even in, in this building, will not have actually uh, known Albert uh, Stanley Jones, Stan Jones as we knew them. He was a man of small stature, but actually of great heart and also great um, uh, ability um, and um, intellect. He actually developed many of the ideas way before their time. Um, he started his lab in the early 1950s, about the same time as Watson and Crick were, were, were producing their uh, paper on the on double helix, and when Lord Cot Todd was already going quite well in Cambridge on nucleic acid chemistry, he started his chemistry lab then. Um, and the ideas he had over the first uh, 10 to 20 years um, uh, in, in the 1950s and 1960s included, for example, chemical synthesis, uh, sorry, chemical reactions on DNA as potential sequencing agents. And he used, before, well before Maxim and Gilbert, he used, for example, specific reactions of potassium permanganate on thymine residues in DNA as potential sequencing reagents. He also had the idea of protecting the 5' prime phosphate of nucleotides um, in order to be able to get them into cells, to bypass kinase so that the uh, nucleoside could be um, uh, released inside the cell. Um, and this is well before Gilead produced their, their uh, uh, um, compounds, which are, um, are well in the clinic now and making a, a lot of money and antivirals. And he also had the idea of chemically neutral backbones, um, of which I was uh, involved here. Uh, the idea was to get them inside cells to interfere by binding to uh, complementary nucleic acids. So he actually had the ideas of antisense way before Paul Zemachnik actually put them into practice and, and produced his wonderful paper in, in 1978. Um, however, he had an autistic son and, and, and uh, never left Birmingham, and he left it to his colleague Dick Walker to go, go to various conferences. And Dick, you might know a bit more better because he was a founder of nucleic acid research, um, no longer with us at the moment. Um, however, I, I worked on these neutral backbones, the acetamidate linkage and the carbamate linkage. In those days, it was very primitive. We could only make some dimers and some rather poorly characterized uh, um, homopolymers. Um, so uh, I didn't get too far in my thesis, although it was published in 1974 and 79. In those days, we didn't publish very rapidly, but the work was actually done before 1973. Um, however, it was 1987 before these materials were looked at again by Jim Summerton. And in fact, he made a series of, of these uh, materials in Poly C, and also Lee Wyeth uh, made the same things in, in the Poly T series, uh, and Oligo C and Oligo T. Uh, they didn't hybridize very well to complementary oligonucleotides. They did a little bit, but not so wonderfully. And therefore, uh, Jim Sumson went on to the PMO oligonucleotides, which have now become, of course, much more important um, in, in, uh, as, as analogs. Um, however, Eric Rosner, very recently actually now, almost 50 years later, uh, has shown that uh, replacing that oxygen by a methylene group uh, actually does give pretty good um, hybridization and can, can replace the phosphodiester in, in a duplex background. Um, and so actually we weren't very far away from getting the right uh, the, uh, uh, idea. And it was all to do with Stanley Jones's original concept here. However, I uh, moved on to uh, MIT as my postdoc, um, and uh, here we were working uh, in Karana's group uh, making uh, synthetic genes. Um, this, in fact, in 1973 to 75, this was the uh, tyrosyl tRNA suppressor gene, um, uh, uh, which is shown here. Uh, these are, this is actually a photograph from 1976, just a year after I left. Uh, it was when the, the synthetic gene was announced. Um, uh, and in fact, um, 
uh, this, these were published in a, a series of papers in J. Bowell Chem in 1979. It was not the first gene that Karana made. In fact, Marv Carruthers here was involved in the previous alanine tRNA gene, but it was the first to be expressed into RNA. And uh, 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 that was a first here. Now, I remember very well, I, I was involved in making oligonucleotides, and the sequence here, GGAGC, GGGGC, was uh, in, ingrained into my uh, long-term long memory. It took me a whole year to make that very G-rich, very difficult sequence at that time uh, by standard solution chemistry. Um, uh, and the, the one afterwards, also in the promoter region, was less G-rich, and it took me a little less time, but it was about nine months. Nevertheless, it was quite a, a difficult and long procedure at that point. Then this then joined up to give you genes use, using uh, uh, the ligase deal, uh, techniques, uh, which are well, well established. Um, but it was not long afterwards Um, that uh, then two years later, uh, when I, I left, I should say that I made lots of friends, uh, which have been lifelong friends in Karana's lab, and in fact, including Marv Carruthers, who referred to the fact that he was passing through the lab at that time and then became a, a lifelong friend and colleague as well. Um, but when I came to Cambridge, I was asked by Bob Shepard, um, who was a peptide chemist, as if I would be interested in uh, looking at his new polyamide solids phase. Um, as potentially for, uh, for, for, for potential for DNA synthesis. He had found it was actually extremely good for peptide synthesis, a peptide chemist, and was freely permeated by polar organic solvents. Um, so I started work o o on that time. Now, I was not the first one to look at solid phase synthesis. The first paper actually by Bob Letzinger from Northwestern uh, in Illinois. Um, a remarkable man, and in fact, I believe he should have got a Nobel Prize along with Bruce Merrifield. He was also working on peptide synthesis at the time when Bruce Merrifield's paper came out, and then he switched to oligonucleotides. Um, and and uh, s several other uh, well-known scientists also looked at uh, 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 oligosynthesis on solid supports, but ba ba basically, on the polystyrene supports of the time, no one could really get it to work. Um, by fortunately, uh, that using the polyamide support and the phosphodiester chemistry, we were, I was able to very quickly um, be able to get uh, synthesis. You're going from a five prime end to the three prime end. Now, the cycle was very long and difficult. It took about 24 hours to do the cycle, which you can see there. I won't go through the various steps, but we use a, a modified Beckman peptide synthesizer to deliver the materials. Um, but there was also, uh, everything was quite manual in intervention. Um, uh, required here to, to, to pre-activate the nucleotide, which had to be delivered. Um, and um, <laughs> This is not actually advancing. There we are. Um, and the, the nucleotide was, was delivered actually from a dry box uh, by ma manually activated, and it went through a, a switching device here, and then uh, the, the actual solid support was in a glass vessel. Uh, this was actually taken out of the, the Beckman synthesizer, uh, and this was uh, uh, located here, and various um, uh, tubes to, to get the, the liquids pumped from the machine uh, into this, uh, this machine, this, this uh, glass vessel. Um, it took actually therefore about uh, two, up to two weeks to make a, an oligonucleotide of, of maybe uh, 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 five, to, five to a dozen nucleotides, and then a quite a long, complicated uh, purification system by Arn Exchange, initially using DAOX, and then I believe I was the first to use um, Arn Exchange HPLC to, to separate the uh, nucleo oligonucleotides at that stage. First of all, it's protected, and then it's deprotected afterwards. So the whole purification, uh, after purification and synthesis, it was about three weeks of work to get an oligonucleotide, but that was a considerably less than the year that was uh, used um, in, in Corona's lab previously. Now, um, the, I, I actually presented this at the Gordon Conference in 1977. Uh, I, I was probably the, one of the only few 
people working on it at, at the time, between, at, starting from 1975, there were a couple of others. Um, but then not long afterwards, Keiichi Itakura from the City of Hope started on a triester method, and not long also, also after that, Marv Carruthers on the well-known phosphoramidite technique. Um, but we went on to synthesize uh, uh, oligonucleotides by the triester method, which Keiichi Itakura had been starting up at that time, and in Bob Shepard's lab. Now, this is actually Bob Shepard, my, uh, my second mentor, um, a wonderful peptide chemist. And most of these people are actually peptide uh, people in his group. But my group, I, I was allowed to have, um, well, uh, Mahinder Singh was my first um, uh, um, colleague, actually. I started on the diester method, and he made solvents and reagents, but I did all the assemblies myself. However, by, by uh, 1979, 1980, uh, I also had my first postdoc, Richard Titmus, and my first postdoctoral visitor, Hans Mattes. All the rest were peptide people. You can see in those days, uh, we didn't have too much worry about health and safety, so we were having a nice party in the, in the lab at that point. So um, now, uh, so, so therefore, we were starting on the triester method. Now, some synthesis from five prime to three prime are different here. And the reason we switched was partly for Itakura's uh, seminal works was starting to work on poly T, but also because Colin Rees had uh, shown that one could remove the chlorophenol uh, phosphate protecting group very specifically with the oximate reagent, and I felt this was now time to make this change. Um, now we started, first of all, uh, again with the Beckman peptide synthesizer on a polyamide support, later on a more rigid polyamide Kieselgur support. Um, Uh, but then, um, we, uh, after uh, uh, some iterations, uh, Marv, and we went from, a, uh, from, from the delivery from the Beckman machine to a Milton Roy pump to pump around solvents. But then Marv Carruthers in 1981 visited my lab and suggested, why don't we use uh, gas pressure? Uh, in fact, we started to do that as soon as it, uh, um, uh, I, I started immediately after with that, and we never looked back. And therefore, using gas pressure, uh, some, some simple apparatus we got from a local company called Omnifit, um, we developed this manual synthesis machine, which uh, Omnifit called the bench synthesizer. It actually never synthesized benches, but never mind. Um, it was just a simple switching device, and you just were in front of it, uh, and had a much, much simpler cycle now. Cycle time was now down to one hour. Um, and following deprotection and purification, you could now make an oligonucleotide much, much faster uh, with, within an, uh, um, a few days. And um, uh, in fact, Brian Sprout, who was my last postdoc on, the, on this method uh, at that time in 1984, synthesized a whole gene uh, using um, four columns in parallel, injecting, of course, nucleotide each set, step, uh, activated nucleotide, the coupling step and then carrying out the deprotections. 22 of them he made, uh, four at a time, and then uh, Mahinder Singh and myself clo ligated them, cloned them into M13, and sequenced them. And that whole synthesis of a gene in 1984 just took us less than three months. And that's one per one, almost just one person working for three months, whereas 10 years previously was about 50 postdoc years to make a gene. So you can see how fast things were already becoming in 1984. However, it was very clear, Marv Carruthers was now publishing some wonderful chemistry, the phosphoramidite method, which was coming out in the early 1980s. And not only that, an exciting new machine from Applied Biosystems, which, had, um, uh, which made uh, the delivery, a fantastic valve block, which was very efficient at delivering uh, and, uh, uh, the nucleotides and, and also solvents. Um, and therefore, um, uh, we, I could see that in 1984, this was the, probably the, the end of the phosphotriester method that we, we would try. Um, the phosphoramidite method gave a slightly higher yield per coupling step, but was also considerably um, cleaner, and we knew we could get to much longer lengths. So it was obvious that we should change, we should use Marv's wonderful chemistry, and I'm so pleased that Marv is going to be actually giving the next lecture here, because I think this is actually, it's this machine, 
uh, here, which uh, revolutionized um, uh, the availability of oligonucleotides to the, um, to the scientific community. We started, we continued to make genes there much more quickly now with oligonucleotides um, assembled on the synthesizer, which are now pure enough to use without purification, uh, and then cloning, and then we published some, some little genes at that point. Um, and we also started the oligonucleotide synthesis service at that time, which actually was going all the way through to 2010, and um, provided oligonucleotides for the whole LMB lab for many years. We were making thousands of them uh, later on. So, um, Sorry? The pointer. Okay, thank you. So, uh, that's given me a chance now to, um, uh, because the DNA synthesis was going very well, to, to do some molecular biology and learn some molecular biology. And um, therefore, we, um, uh, I started with, uh, and that's a very good place to learn it, with Sidney Brenner teaching me and his assistant, Leslie Barnett. Uh, also, Cesar Milstein, I camped on Cesar Milstein as a student uh, at that time, Michael Neuberger, uh, and I learned a lot of molecular biology from him. And we decided to pick the T4 RNA ligase gene uh, to clone and sequence, um, which was so-called unclonable at that time. People said, no, you can't possibly clone it, 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 won't, it won't clone. However, we shotgun sequenced it using Fred Sanger's new DNA sequencing technique found a, a very strong promoter in front of that gene, and then was able to cut that away, and then get it cloned very nicely into E. coli, expressed, um, uh, and then um, made into protein, and we did some site-directed uh, site mutagenesis to actually de decide and find out where, which lysine the adenylation took place on, and we also did some mutagenesis to actually look at the mechanism of RNA ligase as well. Now, this clone of RNA ligase went around the world. There's an enormous number of, of co collaborators who we, we sent the clone to so they could make RNA ligase in their own, own lab. Uh, and this was a, a, a very formative experience. It got us into the molecular biology of the time. Uh, so uh, at the same time of learning molecular biology, we decided we would do some more chemistry in the lab. Um, and uh, uh, it was this time when Sudhir Ragrawal, who's sitting right in front of me, joined the lab. And uh, this was quite exciting because we decided to make some five prime um, phosphoramidites for labeling purposes, and this was the one we published in 1986. Now, Sudia tells me that had we patented this at the time, we probably would have been quite rich people because this formed the basis of a lot of the labeling techniques that many companies used in diagnostics for, for many years. But uh, this was the year time of the monoclonal antibodies fiasco for the MRC, and they weren't pub actually patenting anything. A few years later, it would have been very different. Um, however, so we were doing labeling, um, and also we were doing RNA synthesis. This was a new challenge. Um, we did some work, um, clearly, uh, using the phosphoramidite method again, but using a 5 prime FMOC for hydroxyl protection and a 2 prime acid label, which, which did actually look quite good, and we were thinking about developing that more. However, the 2 prime Salal method of Kelvin Ogilvy was starting to really take off now, and monomers start at the end of 2000, uh, 1980s into the early 1990s, monomers of 2 prime Salal were now available, so we, we didn't proceed with the RNA chemistry and just started to make RNA by the Salal method. Um, but this was, again, quite a productive period. So we went on using RNA synthesis to um, look at uh, the hammerhead and the hairpin ribozymes. Um, it, these, these were small RNAs at the time. They were being looked at for, for, as potential drugs. And the hammerhead ribo, ribozyme, um, uh, we, we were able to look at the defined stereochemical phosphorothioates at the cleavage site to prove what Fritz Eckstein and, and previous Frank Westheimer had, had, had suggested that was an inline cleavage of, um, of the, in the uh, hammerhead ribozyme. And this was in fact correct. Uh, and this paper was quite well quoted for many years. We also went to look at the hairpin ribozyme 
and uh, looked at the, the me mechanism by, by altering the chemistry of the bases that uh, formed um, the structure here uh, and, and looked at the requirements for catalytic cleavage. Um, and we did some also work here. This was a time period of, of a number of workers, including Jane Grasby, uh, Sabine Muller, as, uh, has been mentioned. David Earnshaw in my lab uh, looked at the, the ionic requirements. Um, it, uh, uh, Leo Begelman, who's in the audience here, was working for Ribozyme Pharmaceuticals at that time, and will tell you, just as we knew, that in order to be able to get cleavage in, in solution, you actually needed to have high magnesium concentrations of about 10 millimolar, which actually were not really there in a the cell. Um, uh, and we found that actually one could use aminoglycoside antibiotics and the polyamine spermine to replace magnesium quite, quite nicely. So it, it was obviously something not specific in the mechanism, but with requirements in folding. And not long after, it was discovered that in fact these things make four-way junctions and are much larger. And if you make a four-way junction, now they fold much better and the magnesium requirement is really quite low. So uh, we didn't know that at the time. Um, but uh, it was a very nice period. I, I collaborated with Eric Westhoff and Fritz Eckstein uh, at, at that period there. Um, and and uh, we learned a lot about ribozymes. So um, we then went on to move on to the uh, HIV, um, AIDS, the AIDS-directed program was just starting up uh, in Cambridge and the, and the LMB was looking for people who might uh, work in this area. I thought, having worked on RNA ligase and uh, other a few um, proteins, it might be time to now work on the HIV uh, area and look at the protein nucleic acid interactions here that were involved in, um, uh, 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 in regulation of, of the, the viral uh, um, uh, expression. And with the series of postdocs I mentioned down here, uh, we looked at we first of all made synthetic, leak, synthetic tar RNA, the, the hairpin here, uh, as well as um, model substrates from the uh, ribosome, the, um, uh, the, the rev responsive element, and looked at their interactions with synthetic protein made from genes. We made synthetic gene for TAT, synthetic gene for the rev protein, expressed them, and looked at their interactions. And these were published in the EMBO journal and PNAS. Um, and we looked at ma mapping the residues involved in the rev response element that were invo involved uh, the phosphate interactions with the, um, uh, the HIV rev protein. Uh, and we also did some site-specific cross-linking of an HIV TAT peptide to the TAR RNA duplex, looking exactly where the, 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 the contacts might be between the peptide and the RNA. So this is quite a productive period uh, and I worked here very closely with Jonathan Kahn, a biologist at the LMB. We actually pooled our groups together for a while in order to be able to tackle this problem. We got a number of postdocs from the AIDS-directed program, um, and this was quite a successful period. I also collaborated with uh, Zoe Shabarova at that time as well. Um, so, but um, the TAR RNA and the RRR response were potential sites for interaction for small molecules. And John Kahn started a company called Ribotargets there for look for small molecules that might interfere with RNA protein interactions. Uh, I decided just to stay as a consultant, not to be involved with the company directly, because I was much more interested. I was starting to get interested in anti-sense again. Having started my career in, in uh, essentially in anti-sense ideas, um, I, I thought it was time to go back um, in, the, um, uh, in, in, the, in the 1990s to working on um, a, an anti-scent project. And this seemed to me ideal, that the TAR RNA loop was a, a tar, could be a target for a steric blocking oligonucleotide. Now, Sudhir Ragrawal in, in Hybridon was doing some wonderful work showing that GAPMAS um, in, in HIV could also be used to target um, uh, H viral RNA, but I decided that, uh, that I wouldn't go on to GAPMAS, I would look at the steric block idea, and I teamed up with Jesper Wengel, who was also in the audience, to make 2 methyl LNA mixmas. Uh, I think this was the first paper on, on, on this area. Um, 
to asteric block agents, uh, blocking agents in the uh, blocking of transactivation responsive uh, region, and actually blocking transactivation in cell-free systems. We also did some work on the ribosome as well, on showing uh, the, these things could bind the ribosome quite nicely. Um, at this point, we were starting to look at also PNA. I also thought that, that, that going back to the original idea of having charge neutral oligonucleotides would be just the most important thing. And, and Peter Nielsen, of course, had come out uh, in the 1980s with uh, PNA as, as a potential synthesis, and we learned how to make PNA as well. Uh, a whole series of, 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 of collaborators at this point um, uh, looking at uh, oligonucleotides targeted to the tar RNA region. Um, how, however, it was clear that uh, the industry in the late 1980s, in fact, the first um, uh, conference on, uh, on therapeutics was actually held, uh, uh, I was one of the organizers in 1987 in, in Cambridge. It was actually the, the, the second Cambridge Symposium. Um, and uh, so I'm still very much interested in oligonucleotides, but I'd left it to industry until it was clear that delivery was going to be a major issue. And in the 19, early 1990s, it was clear that this was not going to be an easily solvable problem. And therefore, I thought, um, it would be a, a very good idea to, to start on peptides. And the, the, uh, the, actually, the, um, uh, the ideas here uh, originally came when I was in, um, when Bernard Lebleu, who's also sitting here in the audience, uh, in Montpellier, came to my lab to give a seminar, and then I subsequently went to his lab and, and, and found that the HIV TAT peptide, um, uh, which he had suggested, um, would actually went into cells and it went, and it seemed to go flying into the nucleus uh, very, very quickly. Uh, and this was really excited me. Um, now it turned out that that actually was an, uh, getting into the nucleus was, was actually an artifact, which we learned later. But nevertheless, it, it actually stays mostly in, 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 in uh, endosomes. However, this got me terribly excited and I started a long-term collaboration with Bernard, which has been extremely fruitful over the many years. Um, and we started the methods of making um, peptide oligonucleotide conjugates uh, by a number of techniques. And my first postdoc was Suzanne Perrot, who is uh, in Montpellier uh, now, and she made uh, conjugates of peptide oligonucleotides by a fragment coupling method. And then Dmitry Stetsenko spent a number of years in my lab. We looked at various methods, including native ligation, uh, total synthesis as an option there. But we finally decided that when, when John Turner looked at um, this problem, that we would go back to the disulfide, a much more simple technique of disulfide conjugation. Um, and that was the most simple chemistry to, to use here. Um, and we were able to show that we could get, um, uh, we could in, in, inhibit in, in, um, uh, in a, a HIV tat dependent transaction using. Uh, oligonucleotide analogs, disulfide conjugated to a number of cell penetrating peptides. The activity wasn't enormous, but it, really, it was certainly, that was the first start of it. Um, so the, um, just as a side thing, a step now, I'm just going to take one step aside to look at a side project, which also became rather important in my lab for a time. So I'm just not looking at peptides just for a moment, but for steric block. Steric block was a theme in my lab. And um, uh, Martin Fabani, we had been doing some sRNA peptide conjugates, not terribly successful, I have to say, at that time. And Martin said to me, well, what about microRNAs? It's looked quite a nice area. And I said, wow, fantastic. Yes, let's leap on this and make some, um, uh, the first Antagomir paper from Marcus Stoffel had just come out. And we decided to look at the different chemistries to uh, block um, uh, microRNAs. And uh, Martin Fabani and later Adrian Torres did some fantastic work, and Peter Yerva also worked on this. Um, Peter is also in, in this audience today. Uh, looking at microRNA-122 initially, 
uh, we're using with mixmas of lna 2 methyl and also peptide nucleic acids. And the PNA we actually made with a, a small um, lysine extension on the end just to keep solubility. And we found we did not need a cell penetrating peptide in order to uh, get into cells and block microRNA 122 and also later 155 activity. Uh, what was amazing was that the, the uptake was really rapid. It was not like gymnosis of, of, a, of a lot of an LNA um, taking days. This was done in minutes and it reached the uh, microRNA very fast. In fact, we could get inhibition within an hour, hour or two very quickly, and we did some mechanism uh, studies with our PNA. The PNA turned out to be mechanistically very useful materials, even though actually in vivo uh, the LNA was much stronger in both uh, the um, uh, in, in liver, both in liver and in um, spleen, which we looked at. Both both of these were active. PNA was active in both, but LNA was better. However, PNA turned out to be very useful mechanistically. And doing some work here, we looked at with uh, Adrian Torres uh, how, where the, the PNA goes to in the cell, and we were now fairly sure we've got some good preliminary evidence at the um, in the few years ago that the PNA meets the microRNA probably in an endocytic vesicle, probably in one of these multivesicular uh, vesicles, um, and, and, and counters it there. So it doesn't probably need to get out into the cytosol, and certainly not in the nucleus. Now, I'd love to do follow-up work, we weren't able to continue this, to see how many microRNAs also can uh, react in this way, because I suspect that a lot more can do as, as so. I don't know whether it's all of them, but certainly some of them can do. And I would encourage people to work on the mechanisms here and, and look very carefully to see, uh, and use PNA or LNA uh, to see whether you can target many of these microRNAs without needing to get into the cytosol. That's the side issue. I want to get back to the self penetrating peptides, um, because uh, the splicing direction um, started to become important. We'd worked on HIV uh, for some time. However, Bernard Lebleu pointed out to me that Richard Cole, who was also here somewhere in the audience, um, uh, had a wonderful assay, uh, which was the uh, Hila P. Luke 705 assay in cells, which was a splicing assay to redirect splicing to upregulate luciferase. It was a very uh, wide... Um, uh, dynamic range, this assay, and we did some work with HIV TAT peptide and the penetrating peptide of, uh, was also um, from, um, uh, from uh, Alan Prochions, uh, but um, in, a, in a really actually rather serendipitous discovery, um, uh, uh, John Turner in my lab in a Friday evening experiment decided to con conjugate this R6 penetrating to the uh, his PNA and um, look at it in in in, um, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in HIV transactivation um, initially and found remarkable activity. And when we did the same thing with the uh, splicing assay, this also gave remarkably high activity. So for some reason, these extra arginines on the end made all the difference to the cell penetration. Um, and this really got us. In, into the whole area of cell penetrating peptides in a really big way. Um, so, at this point in 2000, uh, in, in the mid 2000s, it was about 11 years ago now, that I was at a conference. Um, it actually was in Telford in the UK, where um, uh, I met Hai Fang Yin, a, a colleague of Matthew Woods, who was um, giving a poster, and I was giving a talk. And Matthew Wood then came to my lab um, to visit just a week or so later. And we hit up on this remarkable collaboration. Now, I'd, Duchenne muscular dystrophy was something that I'd, I'd, I knew about because Anamika Otsmarus actually had sent me her PhD thesis. It was sitting on my desk and I was already reading it. Um, I'd stood by her poster in Leiden for a conference and she was, uh, thought she'd send me a copy of this. So I was already stimulated in ideas when Matthew Wood approached me and I, I thought um, that working on Duchenne muscular dystrophy now is really where we should be going to turn these oligonucleotide peptide conjugates into a reality, into a potential drug. 
And so we started on this work uh, on, on Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We've also worked on spinal muscular atrophy. And you had a wonderful talk from Richard Finkor on, on Nussin Ursin there. And we've uh, also been working on myotonic dystrophy um, with these expansions, these toxic RNAs, where, which are um, sequestered the muscle blind protein and others. All of these situations are useful for the steric block. It's clear that the sorts of oligonucleotide peptide conjugates could be used in all of these neuromuscular diseases. I'm only going to tell you briefly about um, Duchenne muscle dystrophy. You've actually already heard from Marco Persini about this uh, and um, uh, in Sarepta working on Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So I won't labor the point here, except to say the disease is caused by these deletion and point mutants um, in, in these 79 exons. Uh, leading to truncation and a non-functional dystrophin. And actually what you're doing in uh, antisense is converting the Duchenne phenotype to a Becker muscular dystrophy phenotype, which is a benign phenotype, which is certain in-frame deletions uh, of uh, dystrophin, which leads generally to a normal life expectancy and only very mild symptoms. So you're not actually curing, you're holding the disease um, at a much more benign situation um, and improving the muscle function by, by um, uh, 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 restoring the, uh, the a, 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 a weaker but, but still functional dystrophin uh, to carry out its function here. Um, and uh, from me, from a chemical point of view, I wanted to mention the various types of oligonucleotide that, that have been used. They, are, they have reviewed that in nucleic acid therapeutics in 2014. Uh, the two prime methyl phosphorothiolate, of course, of biomarin, um, which is, I think, rather sad that development stopped here because it still looked quite promising, in my opinion. Um, uh, but that was the way it was. Um, Tricyclos, uh, Aurélie Gouinval um, had several posters here. She's talked a number of times about these. These are really exciting uh, structures. Um, tricyclic ones developed originally by uh, Christian Leumann in Switzerland. Uh, and I think there's a great opportunity here for improving, certainly over the two prime methyl phosphorothioates, and these are in preclinical studies. But of course, my favorite um, ones were the PMOs. Uh, my favorite because they were charge neutral, been developed, of course, by um, uh, um, uh, Jim Summerton back in the 1980s uh, when he decided that the amide backbones that uh, uh, I'd been using and others were, were, were not suitable. The thing is I liked about it was that they were stable to nucleases and proteases completely and just excreted whole. They formed very strong sequence-specific targets with RNA uh, targets, which uh, clearly was very important. Non-toxic, this is actually the key point. You can dose a, a mouse up to a, a gram per kilo or more, and it still sits there quite happily. Um, and of course, it should, had shown in vivo biological activity. So. Um, it was clear that PMO was an important material. Now, we actually started work on Peter Nielsen's work on, on PNA. Um, uh, and we used, initially, with working with Matthew Wood and his colleagues, uh, of course, the well-known MDX uh, mouse, uh, which is, has a point mutation, exon 23, as our model, and which is still the, the gold standard of of how one does these experiments in vivo. And we looked at cells obviously taken from the MDX mouse. And taking our initial R6 penetrating peptide, um, Gabriela Ivanova and, and later others were able to uh, stabilize them against serum proteolysis by putting in some D-amino acids and some amino hexanoic acids here and started to get some uh, what we call PIP, um, PNA or PMO internalization peptides. We said we started with PNA, but very soon switched to PMO. Um, and what we discovered, discovered that these materials uh, showed much higher number of dystrophin positive fibers um, than the, what was originally the um, uh, Sarepta uh, AVI biopharma, as it was, uh, peptide at that point, which was R6, R4, uh, after intramuscular injection. And um, we were so excited by this in early work that we were stimulated to continue work and we get more grants to develop the PIP peptides into potential delivery agents. Um, and uh, over a, a series of year, number of years, we've just we did that 
uh, and various generations of people, um, SLA, Andrei Azamonov, Peter Deuss, P Peter Yerevi here, Thibaut Kursendel, developed uh, PIP peptides, first of all the five series and then the six series. The distinguishing feature compared to the ones from um, AVI Bar Pharma uh, Sarepta was the uh, presence of a hydrophobic patch in the middle of otherwise an arginine rich area. We were able to simplify to arginines on both sides. Um, and this hydrophobic patch actually caused much higher uh, activity in heart. And this was the key thing. Patients die generally either of lung failure or heart failure. And we were excited to see that we could get considerably more activity uh, of exon skipping and, and uh, dystrophin production um, in heart muscle. Um, uh, and that's, that's in fact, uh, it's missing there, heart, that's heart. Uh, compared to the, uh, what was then the standard in, in um, Sarepta, which was the B peptide, very close to the R RXR4. Um, so we published this data. Uh, we knew that the hydrophobic patch could be presented in different ways. It needed to be a minimum of four nucle nucleotides long. Hydrophobic could go up to seven, but we, we stuck with five for most of the uh, work we did. Um, and uh, since then, been carrying out preclinical work. Now, initially, uh, the, the preclinical work, um, we did some work on the, the lead PIP6A, which is always our, our highest activity peptide. Um, however, it became clear that it was going to be, the therapeutic index was not high enough, and we would have to look for some things which were shorter. And therefore, in 2011, we started on a program of shortening the peptide um, with uh, less arginines and came to a uh, further series, PEP7 to PEP9 series, which have not been published, but they are actually in a couple of patents which have been issued now um, on the whole series between PEP2 and PEP9. PIP uh, and actually, this is a PIP9B2. It's one of the leads that we uh, still use um, uh, with ongoing collaborative, and we've collaborated with many different labs. Uh, it's le uh, less toxic than, than PIP6A in vivo, um, uh, but it still has quite high activity. Now, we licensed the PIP series to a pharmaceutical company. In fact, it was uh, um, Shire Pharmaceuticals, um, and, and uh, also Pfizer has taken a license, um, an option, I should say. Um, so there, this is still being developed, but sadly, Shire, uh, th um, in, in 2013, suddenly stopped working with us for reasons we don't really understand. And uh, it was clear that we were going to be frustrated yet again in the development of our peptide uh, PMO conjugates. So we decided we'd have to go it alone um, and uh, uh, work since the since, uh, uh, end of 2013 has been to actually change the peptides yet again. Uh, now we have again quite much smaller peptides um, uh, and uh, we've identified a whole series now, sadly, as an academic, I'd love to tell you all about the sequences of these, but I, now I have to wear, for the first time in my life, put a business hat on because we're trying to start a company. So I'm not allowed, allowed to tell you what these peptides are in terms of sequence. Um, however, we've selected them, uh, and I should say that I, I should, this is where this collaboration with Matthew Wood's lab and Graham McClory from Matthew Wood's lab is right here. One of the scientists has been working on this. Um, and it's because of this wonderful close collaboration that we could um, uh, look at these uh, DPEP peptides very nicely. And we found several promising candidates now in five different series um, which don't conflict either with the PIP peptides, which we had before, or actually with Sarepta's peptides. These are a new series of peptides which we're currently um, patenting. Um, and just to give you a, a glimpse into what the structures are, um, at least they have, first of all, lower arginine. That's actually terribly important. And less than eight arginines is important. The, the PIP9 had eight arginines. You would certainly need below that. And you certainly need a lower hydrophobic content. And the con co combination of the two, which, which Sarepta has also learnt as well, is actually terribly important. And I'm sorry I can't give you precise sequences, but I'm hoping to very shortly. There are quite some novel sequences in here and a novel uh, structure as well. Um, 
However, we've also been applying these uh, DPEP peptides to spinal muscular atrophy. Um, and we've published a couple of papers, first of all on PIP6A, as well as a branch peptide, which quite excitingly, we discovered that actually not only in pups, but also in adult animals, we can get um, uh, exon uh, inclusion and, uh, uh, and some reversal of the uh, phenotype. I'm just finishing now. Um, uh, reversal of the phenotype, um, suggesting that we're getting across the blood-brain barrier after um, intravenous injections. And our new series of DPEP5, which Frank Arbenroth has been looking at, we are actually quite excited about, and we think they are real clinical candidates, and we're hoping to talk to Ionis Biogen uh, about them as potential second-generation compounds after this wonderful nisinersin. We're also working on myotonic dystrophy. I haven't had time to talk to you about that. I also want to briefly mention mitochondrial delivery of PNA, which I think is the next new challenge. Kurt Hugerweiss in my lab now moved to the University of Ghent. Um, you might read this chemistry, a chem biochemic paper. It shows for the first time you actually can get into the mitochondrial matrix using a PNA with a leader peptide. And I think this is great scope for the future here. Um, but I'm now on my last slide. Uh, and particularly, I want to th thank uh, so many people. Um, uh, you've seen a lot of my collaborators, most of them who've uh, been mentioned on, on this, uh, my slides previously. Um, and uh, 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 I don't get to a position here, standing on this podium, without all of their help, which has been absolutely fantastic. They're passing through my lab for many years. Um, and the pathway to oligonucleotherapeutics. We said so we are starting a company uh, which will be based in Oxford. We hope to start this very soon, so people interested, please contact me or, um, or Matthew Wood. Um, in addition, there have been a tremendous number of collaborators here, many of them in this audience, um, and, and it's great that I'm now collaborating once again with Marv Carruthers, which is fantastic, but there are several other people I've not been able to mention we collaborate with. Um, and uh, I also want to thank recent funders um, and supporters, MRC and its uh, branch, its um, uh, technology transfer branch, Oxford University, uh, uh, University Innovation, uh, which has been very supportive, the MDEX Clinical Consortium, a, a consortium of various uh, academics um, in, 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 um, in medics in, in Britain, and a number of funders in the Duchesne area, which have helped us to get going recently, trying to move towards the, the founding a company. So I think you can see that there's been a tremendous amount of friendship of support that I've received, and I really thank everybody for having really supported me in my whole career. And I, th and I look forward very excitingly to the future, because I think that peptides, as we've already seen in this, this, this conference, are really the way forward for delivery for many situations. I'm very pleased to see that Sarepta is moving their peptide PMO forward to the clinic. We hope to be able to do the same with ours. Um, that there are many other projects as well. And I look forward now to the next uh, OTS meetings when perhaps even more peptides will be used for delivery. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mike, for a wonderful talk, and congratulations on all of that fantastic progress with uh, applications in so many different areas. I know we're just about out of time if there's a burning question. Uh, otherwise, I just want to give you your plaque, and then there will be time to ask uh, Mike yeah. questions during the break. We were already running late, and I, I saw that I was da just down to zero. <laughs> <and so. laughs> so again, congratulations, oh, Mike. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.